Fussminster, this morning you shared a video from your mother-in-law, Elizabeth. She's trapped in Gaza with your father-in-law, your brother-in-law, your niece and nephew. It's very upsetting to watch it. Elizabeth's clearly very distressed. She talks about a million people without food or water, nowhere to go, trying to get out of North Gaza. She speaks of people in hospital unable to leave and she asks, where's humanity? Where's people's hearts in the world to let this happen? Why did you share the video? It was a really hard video to watch for both my wife and I, mm. but <clears throat> all we can do in our situation is try to tell people's story. I, I cannot tell you, Beth, how powerless and helpless I feel. Mm not just for my own mother-in-law and father-in-law. So what's your instinct as a family member is to protect your family. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're first minister, whether you're a journalist, whoever you are, your first instinct is to protect your family as best you can. And, and you, I am completely powerless. The you, only thing I can do is share their story. You feel that you can't protect them, there's nothing you can do at the moment? Very powerless. All I can do is share their story. Of course I can do what I've done in the last few days, which is appeal to the international community to set up humanitarian corridors, to end collective punishment, to allow supplies to come in, to allow the innocent people of Gaza to leave. And that's all I can do. But really it is for the international community I have to step up, not for the sake of my mother-in-law and father-in-law, but there are 2.2 million people in Gaza. We all know mm -hmm. the conditions mm -hmm. in Gaza. The vast majority of them have nothing to do with Hamas. And no doubt will have been appalled by what would have happened on those terrible scenes on Saturday morning. They cannot pay the price for the actions of Hamas. Elizabeth ends the video with, may God help us goodbye. Do you fear that you'll never see them again? You know, it's a worry. You know, every day we, we look at our phones uh, every night. My wife will look at our phone every hour because at night is when we're most distressed, as you can imagine. Um, and, and I do not know, I genuinely do not know if I will see my mother-in-law and father-in-law again. Nadia doesn't know if she's gonna see her mum and dad again. And all we can do is watch the news, look at the rolling coverage, wait for messages, and we can go hours without seeing those messages, and hope and pray. Now that's just my experience. How many people across the world are feeling the same? And what about those people in Gaza? Who again are innocent, men, women, and children. Nothing to do with those terrible attacks, disgraceful terror attacks we saw on Saturday morning. They don't know what is going to happen to them. They're being told to leave and they have no way to leave. And that's why the collective punishment is just not justified how, in any way, shape or form. How do you explain this to your little daughter about her grandparents? It's hard. I mean, our 14 year old understands yeah. the situation. She looks on social media. She sees what's happening. She's in a great deal of distress. And I try to distract her as best I can. For my four year old, Amal, we tell her that Granny is scared of the thunder and she keeps asking to speak to her Gran and you know, at times we can get through, most of the time we can't. And then she keeps asking us, is Granny still scared of the thunder? We're saying she's still scared of the thunder. And um, you know, she asked, uh, you know, she asked last night, well, will Granny be back for Halloween? Because my, my daughter loves Halloween like every kid loves Halloween and uh, my Gran, uh, sorry, my mother-in-law uh, helps with the face painting every Halloween. And um, I honest, I mean, we said, of course, she will be back, but in my heart, I don't know if she will. I'm, I'm sorry, it, it, this is obviously really, I mean, you look, you look really tired. I mean, you're pr presumably not <laughs> sleeping. Yeah, I think it's hard for, for all of us, anybody that has family in this situation. Look, I spent a lot of last night with um, the Jewish community in the synagogue in the south of Glasgow. And, you know, I met with the mother of Bernard Cowan. Bernard Cowan's a Scottish member of our Jewish community who was tragically killed in those terrible terrorist attacks. And she and I, we just hugged each other and we cried because that is, I suppose, at the essence of what we're dealing with is common humanity. The innocent people, be they Israeli, be they Palestinian, who have nothing to do with the geopolitical situation uh, and the ones that are being punished. And I completely understand and respect Israel has a right to protect itself from terror, but that cannot be at the price of innocent men, women and children who have nothing to do with those attacks. And that collective punishment has to be condemned. You said 
But before I go on, how, how is Nadia doing today? Because she was on Sky News yesterday. She did a very powerful interview. Obviously, things have changed overnight. Is she, how is she today? The truthful answer is she's in complete distress. And, and my job, before being First Minister, is to be a husband to Nadia, to be a father to my kids. Mm -hmm. And um, I take that responsibility exceptionally seriously. So I'm there to try to support Nadia as much as I can. But I also have a country and a party to run, which is incredibly important for me. Um, so we're doing our best. We have family here in, in Scotland who, and friends who have been incredibly supportive, um, to which I'm very grateful for. But my wife is utterly devastated, mm -hmm. uh, heartbroken. And it's why she's speaking out, because all I think we can do is, as well as calling for humanitarian corridors and so on, is tell the stories of the people that do not have a voice. It must be a huge strain for you, because as you said, you're, you're a husband and father first, but you've got your conference coming and you're the first minister of Scotland. You know, when it comes to conference, I've been in the SNP for almost 20 years. I've always regarded the SNP as a family. It can be a dysfunctional family at times, of course, like any family can be, have our disagreements. But we're a family and I've taken great solace in the messages I've had. Actually, not just from my own party, I have to be absolutely honest, uh, really people from across the political spectrum and across the world have reached in. That gives me and my family great comfort. As I say, that, that job is important. It's my first job, being a husband mm -hmm. and a father, but also equally my job as First Minister and party leader is one uh, that I uh, take exceptionally seriously and that I'm, uh, of course, concentrating on too. You talk about feeling powerless and, and all you can do is, is share the story in the hope that it, it garners a response. You also said that the Israelis know where your family are. You said the Israeli government know where our family is. They know the coordinates. To that extent, my hope is that they won't be hit. Have you, have you managed to communicate with the Israelis at all? Have you asked them to avoid targeting the house where your family are? So, so our main conduit, is, of course, as you'd understand, would be the Foreign and Commonwealth mm. uh, Office, so the British government, the Foreign Office, are our main uh, conduit. Uh, if you'll forgive me, I don't want to go into too much detail about mm. what conversations have taken place or not, because it's still a very <coughs> difficult and yes. precarious situation. And they're in Gaza, which is largely under the control, as you know, mm -hmm. um, of, of, of Hamas. So uh, you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll not go into the intricate kind of minutiae of the detail, but the, the, the Foreign Office continues to be the main conduit by which we interact. Have you spoken to the Prime Minister about it? Have you asked him to help? No, I have written to James Cleverly, and, and although I have had uh, a junior foreign office minister, uh, Lord Amit, to be in touch, and I was grateful for, for his assistance. Um, I'm disappointed, yeah. I have to say, that James Cleverly himself um, it, hasn't been in touch because we've told him there's two UK citizens. I mean, he was yes. in Israel, he was not necessarily yeah. far away from Gaza. I'm not suggesting he would have gone, but he could have clearly picked up the phone to give me an assurance that they are working day and night to get those two UK citizens mm. out of Gaza. But from James Cleverly, I'm pretty disappointed to see So that. the Foreign Secretary hasn't been in touch, the Prime Minister hasn't been in touch? No, neither of them. What, how do you feel about that? Disappointed? I'm pretty angry that the Foreign Secretary... Um, I'm not necessarily expecting the Prime Minister to pick up the phone, but I would have thought that the Foreign Secretary, and not just for me, I've also asked for details around other Scots that might be trapped in Gaza, other Scots in Israel that might be looking to get out. Um, but the fact that the Foreign Secretary has well, so far ignored my letter, but also not been in touch, it, it makes me angry. But I'd be more interested in getting the Foreign Secretary to speak yeah. up about creating a humanitarian corridor to allow supplies to come in and allow people of Gaza to leave. And first minute, you've talked about, you, you just talked about it, about the collective punishment. You, you presumably you would, what, urge restraint in Gaza by the Israelis in terms of bombardment of the Strip, a potential invasion force? What, whatever would, you, what would you like to see Whatever happen? tactic is used, whether it's a ground invasion, it's aerial bombardment, it's naval through, through, through the sea, whatever the operational tactic is that's used, the message is, I think, should be pretty simple, that the innocent men, women and children of Gaza should not be the ones that are suffering as they currently are. Mm. Collective punishment cannot be justified, neither legally, but morally cannot be justified. So any of us that care about humanity, which is I think the vast majority of people, would say that collective punishment, targeting, um, you know, understanding that, that Israel has to respond to the atrocities it saw yes. on Saturday, we all understand that and accept that. 
it cannot be the price of innocent so, people. So, because I mean, Israel's response would be, you know, if we do nothing, terrorism wins. You don't think they should have a ground force go in? You no, I, I, I keep going back to the point I make, Beth, that whatever military tactic they use is for them to decide, whether it's yes. a ground, aerial, naval, that's, that's for them to decide. But what cannot happen, regardless of that military tactic, is for innocent men, women and children to pay the price. Yeah. What has to be done now, immediately, today, is the opening up of a humanitarian corridor. The humanitarian corridor has to allow Gazans, innocent men, men women and children, to leave and it has to allow supplies, medical supplies, food, fuel, clean drinking water to come in. I'm going to do an awkward pivot now and, and, no, and, and talk t about d domestic politics. Um, thank you for, <coughs> for talking to us for so long about that. I know it's not, it must be very difficult for you at the moment, so I appreciate you. No. Look, I understand. Uh, um, <coughs> now, going on to being first minister, you've been first minister for, for six months. It's been a difficult six months, I think that's fair to say. Um, the SNP former chief executive, former first minister have been arrested, supporting the polls is plummeting. You, cost, you lost a key by-election to Labour. You go into your first party conference as SNP leader, split over independence, uh, plus a defection. There's quite a lot to choose from there. What's been the low point? Actually, the high point, if I may reverse the question, has been the fact that I'll go into this party conference with, uh, of course, the largest political party in Scotland, more than any other political party in Scotland combined. Even with those challenges in Rutherglen and the defection, we still have the most MPs than any other party combined, the most MSPs, of course, and the most councillors, and support for independence at around 50%. Mm. So, of course, it's been challenging. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Uh, What's but, been the uh, worst bit for you? I, What's I'm, hurt the most? I, the by-election, the defection, I, I, I am always a, a, a glass half full as opposed to a glass half empty guy. So, of course, nobody wants the by-election defeat. Nobody wants those challenges uh, that you mention. Uh, but I'm always focused on what we can deliver, the positives. And I've got no doubt, once conference is finished, we're going to go out there as a party, united, but also in Boyntwood. The, just on that, though, the, the USAF effect in the polls is that Sturgeon's SNP polled 45% with Labour back in third on 18%. The recent polls put you at 32 to 34%, with your lead over Labour down to just 2 or 3%. That's not comfortable. No, of course, it's not where we want to be. But I think by anybody's objective analysis, they would recognise that many of those factors, of course, have been out with my control. You mentioned, for example, the police investigation. I have no control over that. Or but has that hurt, that's hard. Of course, the SNP. It has. of course. It so has. it's something hard to you that's beyond your control as leader. Yes, of course. There's issues that are out with my control. So what I've got to what I've got to factor in is what am I in control of? So I've got to can, make sure that the party is trusted to deliver on the priorities of the people of Scotland. I believe we will and can do that. Can I jump in on that, First Minister? Do you also feel that until those uh, that police investigation is concluded, you, you can't move the party on, is that fair? Look, the longer the police investigation goes on, then the more difficult, undoubtedly, it's going to be for the party. I respect the police has to take mm. whatever time it feels necessary. What I've got to focus on is what, is, what, what am I in control of? And I am in control of making sure the Scottish Government delivers, as we have done for 16 years, delivers on the priority for the people of Scotland, and that's got to be where my entire focus is. And I, I'm just... just and, and what else you're in control of is kind of independence policy, subject to the party. The party seems to be in dispute over what many seemed as a doomed plan on how to get another independence referendum. Nicola Sturgeon's position was if the SNP achieved more than 50% of the votes in the next Westminster elections, you'd have a mandate to call for another independence referendum. The SNP got 45% in 2019, so that would be progress that would be momentum for the SNP if you got over half. You've lowered the bar. You said that you have a mandate if you win the most seats in Scotland at the next election. Does that remain your policy? Uh, yes, again, we'll look at the amendments that have come up from the party conference and I'll be trying to accept... Because that might change the policy, so that's what I'm trying to get yeah, a well, handle on. Well, exactly. I mean, I'll, I'll consider the amendments and still considering the amendments because I'd like to accept as many of them as I can, but the basic premise will stay the same. The basic premise is this. If you want to test a proposition for 50% plus one, then give us a referendum. We'll do that tomorrow. If you're denying us that, which is denying mm. the Scottish people the choice over their own future, 
then the next election we can test that proposition is in a general election. And you've covered, I expect, far more general elections uh, you, than I have, and you know very clearly that the general election rules are pretty simple. You, Those just, that win just to be the clear most though, seats win the general your, election. Is your, are you now considering moving from most seats to majority of seats for the mandate? Exactly, exactly considering, because that's an amendment that's been put on the table. But what's, what, do you think that seems reasonable to you? Look, I, I, I am going to go into that general election looking to not lose seats, but retain the seats we have. And no, I think there's a I possibility... Mean, I don't, I'm going to answer your question. Yeah. Retain the seats that we have, and actually I think there's a possibility of even winning some seats, particularly uh, from the Conservative Party. So uh, whether it's the most the majority seats, again, I'll come to a definitive view by the time we have, of course, our, our, our conversation on Sunday, our debate on Sunday... That for me, I'll always look to build upon what we have, not to lose what we have. I mean, <laughs> if it was the most seats, you could get 24 and Labour could get 23 and then you could claim a mandate. I mean, that would be ludicrous, wouldn't it? No, I, I mean, mean, again, if you, if I you, mean, if you win it, the most seats, it would you, be though, wouldn't it? If you win the most seats, you tend to, to, if you win the most seats, you tend to be the winner you've of the won, general election. You've got 48 election. seats at the moment. You can't possibly say we've got justification to call for a referendum when you... So you come out with 20, half of those of the most seats. Look, remember, scenario. of course, before the referendum in 2014, we were at six seats. So actually, you know, that, that number will undoubtedly fluctuate election to election. Uh, you've covered elections as I have. The party that wins the, the most seats tends to be declared the winner of that general election. And then you can push forward with the mandate that you have in your manifesto. But look, to be clear, the amendment is there, is one I'm considering, one I'm open to. We'll take it to the conference floor and let conference decide. Do you think you've got any hope of any, any sort of independence referendum before 2030? Absolutely. If you we really create, do? Yes, if we create the conditions. And the conditions are, given that Westminster continues you to deny the voice of the Scottish people... You that it won't the cut the with Westminster. The con, but the conditions, we have to make it politically impossible, as we did with the creation of the Scottish Parliament. And that means that we have to increase support at a consistent majority, for a consistent majority for independence. If we do that then it becomes impossible for the UK parties to continue to ignore Scotland's voice. If you go back in Westminster elections seat-wise... Again, uh, the point is that, of course, winning a general election means that you're able to, put, uh, to take forward the mandate that you have in that manifesto. That has been the rule since general elections have started, uh, and for the many general elections, undoubtedly, that you will have covered. That has always been the rule. So I'm going to continue with that proposition, uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, if we win that general election, then we will be able, we will be empowered, and we will have a mandate to take forward that manifesto. Final question: Polls bad, a defection, which I haven't asked you about. By-election lost, incoherent plan on independence that you admit is not really going anywhere with the UK government. If, as we approach the next UK general election, Holyrood elections in 2026, the USEF effects remains negative, will you consider your position? Uh, look, it will be for the Scottish people to give their verdict on the SNP and their verdict to me. I go into that general election believing we can win it. I certainly go into the holiday election 2026 uh, with a huge amount of confidence that we'll come back for a historic fifth term. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it.